Welcome to Working Dog Radio, <laughs> broadcasting the bite. Hey guys, Alicia with Working Dog Radio here again. I wanted to take a moment to talk about one of our newest sponsors, someone that we are super, super happy with um, and glad to have aboard, somebody that we have known since they literally got into the game. Aiden and Jesse from Rex Specs literally made a product so that they could enjoy life with their dog. Uh, Their dog suffered from Panis and they wanted to take their dog skiing and they went out and they made goggles that fit their dog. And now they make products for your dog, my dog and everybody's dog. And we've watched them grow and we are so proud of them and proud to know them. Uh, All their products are American made. They are supporting us who support them. Uh, These goggles are UV protectant. They protect your dog's eyes from dust, from particles, from anything that could get in the way if you take your dog to the range. One of the products that Ted and I use most often is their Ear Pro. They have canine Ear Pro. It pulls over your dog's head and it protects their ears. So if you go to the range, you're doing gunfire acclimation, whatever you're doing, those things work great. They have leashes. They have all kinds of cool stuff. You really need to check them out. And we are very glad to have them aboard and very proud of their products. We do have some. We will give some away. Keep watching for us. If you check them out on the socials, it's at Rex Specs, S P E C S, the letter K, the number nine, and also RexSpecs.com. If you use the discount code Working Dog Radio, all one word and all lowercase, you'll get 20% off your first order. Working Dog Radio, broadcasting the bite. I am uh, Ted Summers um, from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, before we get started tonight, I kind of want to talk about something real quick. Um, from the very beginning of this uh, podcast, we've had several people support us, um, both on the manufacturer side, um, like Dogtro and ALM, um, several other vendors. Uh, but also we've had a guy kind of in the background. The music that you hear on the intro and the outro is from an artist named Brother Deeg. Uh, he's from Louisiana. Super talented guy, Grammy winner. Um, he had a song in um, Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained. And a uh, super nice guy. I actually met him at a concert in a terrible shithole bar here in Tulsa um, called Mercury Lounge. Shout out to Mercury Lounge. They're a dive bar. They know it. But I literally just approached him and said, I know you own the rights to your music. Um, Would you mind if we used it? He was like, yeah, man, that's great. Uh, It's a cool idea. Just, you know, link to my stuff and um, it'll be great. Uh, Over the years, he's actually checked in on us. And so around episode 50, um, he checked in on us and said, hey, um, it's actually closer to 75. But he said, you know, I was at a show in somewhere and I had a guy come up to me and said, I heard you on a podcast. They had, they use your music. So there's some handler out there that went to a show of his and (laughs) and approached him and said, I heard your music because of working dog radio. Uh, And then when we uh, had episode 100, uh, he emailed us and said, Hey, I love what you guys are doing. Congratulations on hundred episode. Um, At any rate, uh, brother Deke passed away March 8th. Um, and yeah, it sucks. So super talented guy. Um, sucks to hear it. I always loved, I saw him, I don't know, five or six times over the years. Great live, super talented, but yeah. Anyway, um, so go listen to Brother Deke. If, uh, yeah, other than that, um, I'm Ted from Tulsa as always. Um, <laughs> Eric is someone in Canton, Ohio, and it was snowing today. You were training in Akron in a movie theater though. Yeah, it was a pretty good time. This movie theater, um, you can see it right off the highway, and it's off this little road, just just in South Akron, and um, which is about twenty minutes north of Canton. And um, the guy who owns, who bought the theater, excuse me, owns like four car car dealerships right there, all on that little road. I think I heard him say he owns nine and a half acres or nine and a half miles of property. I don't know, a fucking lot of real estate, and so he's gonna demolish that movie theater and make it into a dealership another dealership and it's yeah. like the view from the highway you can see it everybody around here knows that that movie theater um so yeah he's been allowing uh, swat teams to go in there and canine units and bunch of of them going in there so i've been met, working with akron pd for the last couple of months um at their maintenance training so they told me to come up and a broad garber came up and a few of his guys and 
Um, my buddy Travis Lloyd came, uh, brought some decoys with him. And uh, so we work in scenario. I was only there till like 1230. Um, I had to go back to the pet business. But uh, yeah, we had fun, man. It was a good time. The place is heated. And has bathrooms, most important. So. It's super important. Yes. Yeah, I saw uh, I saw at Garber and Simon. Speaking of which, Simon got his last certification. He is retiring. So, yeah, they might be coming to me for a dog. I don't. I don't quite know yet. They actually both of their dogs are due up here pretty quickly at the same time. So, um, I don't know how that's going to work because I don't have a kennel anymore and I don't provide police dogs. But uh, I'll probably steer them in the right direction, or at least maybe I'll do the training get have them get a green dog somewhere or maybe even import it have them go get it and everything but so yeah man it was fun i just set up some ridiculously stupid scenarios like i like to do um the place is neat uh upstairs the second floor was um this long hallway on with theaters on either side so i fuck i don't know you know i expected maybe there's a room up there where they a guy sits in there gets the the movie and everything but what it actually has is a, a computer stack behind each one, and the movies are shipped in from Tennessee, some main parent company. And they just, a guy probably goes up and just hits play and just keeps on moving. So um, the computer oh. stacks were a good place to hide dope today. So that's what we <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So, yeah. So then um, I don't know if there's any videos. Uh, the video of Simon, what I did was I had him, I had the decoy standing up in the, top of the movie theater so you send the dog in he turns sees him and then it's a race and then the decoy's whole job was just to try to keep away from the dog fend him off with garbage cans anything you can do there which you know we like fended type scenarios those are always fun um and then put some pressure on the dogs and then travis could go in and instruct the decoys on stuff and the decoys that were standing around because akron pd is pretty cool they do a thing Basically, like you got a prospect with them, so you have to be on their list of decoys at their department for years before you can get in as a dog guy. Oh. Um, huh. yeah, it's I like it, it's pretty good. I did now, and listen, there's guys that have decoyed in there for five, six, seven, eight years, don't have a dog, might not ever get a dog. Promotions come up, you know, and they miss their, their chance, but they get to help and, um. So now I have Travis coming in to teach them, they, you know, they just helping their decoys get better you know he's one of sean edwards's like graduates right yeah uh, yeah he's a brown shirt so and he, like you have to and we need to have sean on and uh, i thought you were working on that yeah well <laughs> yeah i talked to sean about it he's he would rather i said we'll have travis on if you want you know travis is great he's he would be good he's got a very interesting history um sean just doesn't like that stuff you know so yeah. i'm not speaking out of turn <laughs> it's what he said ah, i don't really like it so um but anyways uh yeah it was good time man um but it was sideways snow today yeah, uh, yeah. fuck tomorrow's supposed to be high like 34 32 something i'm supposed to start climbing but um listen i can't complain this winter has been nothing like literally i think we've sh- shoveled twice twice in the whole winter like it ha- hasn't been that bad the the lake i live at froze one time only one time for about froze to where you could fish and get out on it like three days. That was it back in February. Um, usually it, it'll start freezing in December, or January, and then it's a block of ice until, you know, about now. So anyways, what do we got going on today? We have um, a handler uh, and trainer from Edmonton, Canada and uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Sorry, and uh, it's Jason Bourne, not like the CIA Jason Bourne. Uh, when I saw the name, I was like, "Oh, the memes for this can be fucking fantastic!" Like Jesus Christ, that's Jason Bourne. Um, so, uh, twelve years experience as a canine handler and canine trainer, um, certified patrol trainer from um, the Canine Law Enforcement Accre- uh, Accreditation Registry, and was a tracking judge for the Canadian Police Canine. Association National Championships raised several puppies, which we're going to talk about because they have a cool program up there. Um, went on to be successful police dogs, and um, a lot of the teams that he's trained have gone to the Canadian Police Canine Association National Championships. Several of them winning top dog award. Um, and you start. He started his own company, which we'll talk about too. On 2023, um, they provide police canines, uh, summers across Mar- North America, private pet training um, in the Edmonton area. So tonight with us from 
Edmonton, which is still cold. <laughs> Jason Bourne. Jason, how are you? I'm good, guys. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. Um, so give us a little bit of your background, like how you got into law enforcement, and then we can kind of go down the uh, where we got into dogs and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, uh, first off, thanks very much for having me on. I appreciate it. I, uh, I do listen to you guys regularly, and you provide a lot of good content to the working dog world, so thanks for that. For me, for law enforcement, I, I joined a little bit later in life. It was kind of like an early midlife crisis. Uh, so I became a cop in 2003. I went through the academy, through the recruit class, and hit the streets in 2004. I was quite fortunate where one of my training officers was one of our puppy handlers for our canine unit, where where your job is to raise puppies for the unit. So it kind of got a really a really quick intro to how police dogs work and and how they uh, their function and role in policing, and that kind of kind of got me hooked right from the start. Um, and we're similar where you mentioned earlier about uh, putting in all those hours. Uh, we have we call it a quarry program. So. If you want to get in canine in our department, you have to quarry. And, and uh, the expect, expectation is at least once a month, kind of like 100 hours a year type thing. All on your own time. It's a volunteer situation. You're not getting paid for that. Um, so I started my quarrying back in 2004. Did that for four plus years. And then I was kind of lucky enough to go through the process and get picked to be a, what we call a puppy holder. Uh, at that stage there, now you start raising puppies for the canine unit. Um, and you'll do that. You can do that for one, two, three, four years. It kind of just depends on the openings and the vacancies in the unit. Uh, so I did that until 2010 when I, when I was lucky enough to, to get my chance to go into the canine training class. Yeah, every time I've done a seminar up there and they always call decoys quarry and I'm like, <laughs> I have to like, I kind of shudder for a second. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, they're like, yeah, it's a decoy. I'm like, oh, okay. They're like, where's the quarry? And I'm like, the, the quarry. Because for me, a quarry is like a hole in the ground where we dig rocks up. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand, like, and it's also like, you know, quail and shit, but I, I'm like, oh, we're, like, so it, it always it makes me bar. Like last time I was up there with the HRD guys and they, it was like, who's quarrying, who's quarrying. And I'm like, what is the fuck are you guys talking about? And so, yeah, but, uh, yeah, so it's good that you have to like, it's a, they have a similar program like that. So talk a little bit about the, um, that puppy process. So that's a kind of it's definitely unique i think definitely in north america it's unique because nobody here does that lapd tried to do it we had on a handler from um uh, uh hitting from south carolina and they do a version of it with their bloodhounds um and eric i don't know that anyone else does it i mean it'd have to be a large agency that does it but it's very much a thing in canada like rcmp does it you guys do it um, I think the Winnipeg guys, I think I talked to them and they do it. Um, I'm sure the guys in BC do it. Um, I, I, because they have large agencies, I'm sure the guys around Toronto do it as well. I oh, we haven't talked to any of them, but I'm sure they do. Um, so talk a little bit about that process. Um, because it, it definitely, I wish people did it here so that I wouldn't have to deal with some of the shit that I deal with. <laughs> yeah. And our, our, our pro like our program has changed over time. Like we used to be almost exclusively raising puppies. And getting them into you know ready for the street and hit the streets whereas now we're kind of only raising maybe one or two puppies at a time and we're still buying green dogs who you just can't keep up to the vacancies and we and we all know uh raising a puppy is a ton of work like uh, the amount of hours you're going to put in is if you look at it from a business sense it's not a good business sense but um you really have a chance to have an influence on the dog you're going to have on the street so when I went up to Van, uh, Vancouver and did a like a three day fun seminar with those guys up there, we had a blast. They uh, also say quarry, but they refer to puppies like their green dog school as puppy school, like all the way up to untrained. Is that kind of you guys the same kind of verbiage like nationwide or? Yeah, we'd be very similar. Yeah, it's a it's kind of like a puppy until it hits that dog master class, and then we call it a prospective police service dog at that point. But. Yeah, well, it's getting raised up to 15 or 18 months. It's, it, yeah, it's in our puppy program for sure. Also, shout out to the folks from Vancouver because they fucking drink. Yeah, <laughs> we had them in an HRD <laughs> seminar in Bend. Um, them boy, yeah, we had two of them in, in the Bend seminar, and yes, they do. It was like <laughs> as soon as the last bite was done, okay, I was like, oh, shit. It's fucking four o'clock. <laughs> Let's go. Well, when they picked us up from the airport in Winnipeg, like tan after the whole shit show with the Border Patrol, um, the Canadian Border Patrol, uh, mm -hmm. they handed us each a bottle of Crown Royal. I was like, oh, okay. So it's it's that kind of, I was like, welcome to Canada, eh? I'm like, I, yeah, sure, bro. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> dude, we were drinking, we were drinking, they were talking shit. We were drinking um, 
Milwaukee's best I and know. Pabst Blue Ribbon. <laughs> I, no shit. Yeah, I was like, like, dude, I, all this is going to do is make me pee. Like, <laughs> where's the little bats, bro? Yeah, maybe uh, it was a different different version of it. So, real quick, so let's talk about that puppy. Like, um, you have a group of like breeders that you guys have a success with, or how's that work? Yeah, you know that's that is the hardest part of doing puppies, right? Is to find good breeding, good breeding, good good puppies. Uh, it's super competitive. If a breeder is putting out good puppies, we've been lucky. We've had some connections over in Europe over the years where we've gotten some really nice puppies uh, that were sent over from Europe. Um, kind of our model has changed now though, where if we can't test the whole litter, we're not really interested in the puppy. Like we want to see the whole litter, test the whole litter, and then we'll, we'll make a selection from there. And we've, we've tested many a litters and not picked a puppy at all. We, you got to have a standard and you got to stick to your standards. I do. I like that. That's pretty good. So, so let's use a round number of eight. eight every time you get a litter of eight, what's your percentages of success? Like I'm dogs that make one, it. Pick one. Oh, like of the ones we pick, we're probably mm-hmm. 500 to be to be totally fair and frank yeah. we're we're probably batting 500 if one we pick one we raise to that 12 months and kind of do some testing yeah 500 is pretty accurate where does it fall off where do you find the problems most times the problems are going to be in the in the bite work just not not maybe not serious enough right not a good enough grip uh, environment wise if you get that puppy at seven weeks of age the puppy's going to be pretty strong in environment um, it's usually the bite work is what sinks us that makes sense so then do you have an entire list of people waiting to take the failures well it depends on the breeder some have contracts where they have to go back to the breeder so oh, i see what you're saying it, yeah. it all depends on that as well yeah because we talked to um oh who was it somebody that real big in a puppy said man i have a whole entire network man i've had because he's a breeder like he breeds but raises them up who um <laughs> was that subtle yeah yeah so yeah, okay. yeah so he's got a network yeah. of people like and it's taken him a while to to build that but um yeah, I guess he doesn't. He's the breeder, so he doesn't have anybody to to respond to. Um, so you guys, they live at the kennel, or each one of you take one. Say, say you got two puppies. Uh, out uh, so that was my role as a trainer, as a unit trainer. Um, once my my working dog retired, um, I was a full time trainer at that point, and that was my job. I, I have a kennel at home that's a split kennel, and I would try and have two puppies in there at all times, and if, obviously a few months apart, so you can kind of having like going through at different stages but as the tree as a unit trainer that's your job is to raise puppies yeah i don't know i don't know how, what, if i would dig that be, if, <laughs> you know it would probably it'd be interesting i guess you know and it it like a proud papa moment though if the dog if you raise it and he ends up getting out there and doing you it. you know and one of the things and i'm happy with my vendor that i use now and eric you know him Mm-hmm. um used him before too but um and he doesn't do a ton of the uh, raising of the puppies i will say that the ones that he does raise that he has sent me have been great like aries and torch uh and i think there was another one um but the dogs have been great um but the problem that i always see that i well not that i always see the problem that i get with a lot of these dogs is um the europeans are really good at raising dogs to pass selection because they know how the North Americans and the Australians and the South Africans and whoever, like how they know how we select dogs and what we look for, but they do not prepare them for training. So when they get here, right, they're usually fucking hot as shit. (laughs) And they, you know, for the last like two months of their life, they've been get out, bite, get put back up, get out, bite, get put back up, get out, bite, get put back up. And I'm like, look, I get it. You can fucking bite. You need to do something else though. (laughs) So, and the other thing that they do is the self-discovery method of allowing that, like to demonstrate hunt, right. They'll, you know, bouncy, bouncy, and then they'll hide the tennis ball in like a you know, they have a whole drawer, room with a bunch yeah. of shit in it and they allow the dog to dig and self-discover. And I'm like, Stop fucking doing that guys. Like we've had cases that the Idaho case which doesn't affect you, but for the Americans listening to us, like we had the case in Idaho where the dog touched the car and they vacated a sentence because of it. And it's, I'm like, you know, and, and that's you know, gaining steam with that. Other and that is yeah. gaining steam. Yeah. Where was, yeah. That case just happened. Eric texted me the other day about a case um, that where the, another case was thrown out because the dog put his nose through the window and crossing the threshold of the window, the window being rolled down, his nose crossing the threshold constituted search. So, um, you know, when they have a ton of experience and self-discovery that way, 
unfucking that, it becomes kind of a challenge in the first three to four weeks of doing detection work, like not letting them touch odor, not letting them touch boxes, not letting them use their fucking paws. Like, so, and I know that that's a learned behavior. And I sit back and think, I'm like, fuck, if I could raise a dog, like if I could raise all these dogs, they'd never do that because I wouldn't ever let them do it. But because <laughs> like, you know, and the testing process in the United States for vendors or for departments, not necessarily for vendors, is so ingrained that it'll take us generations to get out of it. Um, they're like the and everyone that does testing you know this everyone that does testing thinks that they have the secret sauce like they have some kind of <laughs> fucking hotline to god and they're like i know that this dog is gonna be great because <laughs> of my secret super secret test and i'm like okay i'm sure you do but it's the doll test the same shit but they learn bad habits early on to pass testing right they want to see this insane fucking dog out of control with yep. drive 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 we had eric, you know. eric our third episode we had drive on we had subtle on he said, he was like, fuck, this dog's got enough drive for three police dogs. How much more do you need? <laughs> like, he's got enough. Jesus Christ. Like, so then capping and like it became, it, it becomes like nothing would make me happier than having an entire class of police dogs that I didn't have to cap. Yeah, that'd be great. And it won't happen unless I raise them or somebody like us raises them. So, um, and that's not talking shit about the Europeans. They create great dogs are super healthy and whatever else, but, and they, they test well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, for fucking sure they test well and they will bite stuff and tear stuff up faux show we've talked about uh how the dog in industry or culture in uh the working dog culture in europe goes back so far like it's generational and that's why like the vendor that that ted and i are using can travel around europe to a farm and find yeah. two dogs you know fucking great dogs you know a guy has some other job but it's just in their culture and in in the u.s i mean there's people who've tried they've tried to, to they're trying to be breeders they're trying we still end up going back there what's the culture in canada like with when it comes to that working dog puppy culture you know what uh i think raising puppies is kind of it's getting less and less in canada obviously the rcmp that's that's the foundation of their program they're never getting out of that but for any, any of the city departments it's getting less like the fact that we still raise puppies it's more the minority now just because the amount of work that it is but like we touched on earlier if you get a super strong puppy and you raise it properly you can't buy a dog like that like no. that is it's going to be a top-notch dog if it had the right genetics to begin with right and you put the right work into it um you're not going to get a dog from europe like that that dog is just not likely for sale no they're not <laughs> no, no, right, not to no. us anyway not to department i mean <laughs> yeah, they're for exactly. sale to the americans but nobody can afford them i mean you're not yeah. gonna they, yeah there's not the dogs that are working the chinese yet, with right. a giant pile of money on the other side of the field yeah. is who gets that dog yeah, um exactly or the so timing, what is yeah. it what is what does it look like um kind of a, a sped up version of raising that puppy and what you guys i'm sure have a kind of a formula based you got to mix it up for the dog a little bit but what does that look like as the dog is aging through his uh youth so when again in a perfect world like science they say i guess is 49 days seven weeks age of age that's the best time to test that puppy uh, once we select that puppy from that day on uh, we're really working on environments a ton right to start with uh, whether it's sounds uh, stairs floors shiny things you name it um tons of environmental training those first several weeks and we're going to start the bite work at that age too seven weeks of age right flirt pull starting to chase the flirt pull building that drive starting to build a grip uh building that want uh the want to bite and we'll start building some hunt already at that age too right we're, and we're going to go super hard until teething starts um, that teething might start usually around four months of age at that point there we're going to really back off obviously you can't do any bite work when, while they're teething so we're going to back that right off and then it's going to be strictly really working on the environment during the teething phase. And then around that six to seven months of age, when teething's done, now we're going back into the grip, building the hunt, building the grip. Uh, and we're doing obedience all the way along the way. Um, but again, and building those environments. I don't know, some of the lectures I've been to, a lot of people say week six to 16, most important weeks of a dog's life. Um, those are the important weeks for environment, for really exposing the dog to lots of different things. And if it doesn't, the belief is if it doesn't hurt the dog, uh, the dog's going to overcome that and be strong in those environments for the rest of its life. So, again, that's that's something you don't get when you buy adult dogs, right? You're buying uh, – when I'm buying adult dogs, I was always trying to buy the least amount of problems, right? Hmm. So, 
If, uh, if you got you a know, pup, hopefully you can avoid that. I've said this multiple times. That's a good way to put it, by the way. Yeah, exactly. I'm, you're buying the least amount of farms. Fuck. Yeah. I've said this multiple times and you know, there isn't a zero, there isn't a dog in this, on this continent that's working that was washed for its inability to recognize target odor. They're washed one for their lack of willingness to look for it. And two, they're washed because of weird environmental problems. I've seen dogs that were fucking monsters, but anytime anything weird happened and you can usually see it. So a secret that and I, people have heard me say this before, if you haven't, I'll tell you now again, for you're listening to this and you're testing green dogs. If you have a dog that gets funky on bite work, just basic back tie shit with like an inside bite, or a, he gets really weird with decoy pressure, 100% he will have an environmental problem and vice versa. If you see a dog that has a funky environmental problem is shit that he shouldn't like just nothing weird, like just like slick fours or yeah, like vacuums floors, or yeah. something, anything funky, he will have a problem with decoy pressure. Those two are interlinked and you know, there, I'm sure there's some scientific explanation. That's not me though, but I just know that those two things, like if I'm testing and I'm looking at in a dog environmentally or watching a dog work on a new decoy in a new environment and he shows me some kind of hesitation he will 1000 percent have and it's just a matter of finding it so if you're testing like look at that like if he acts all funky on weird bites and he acts all funky he acts funky with decoy pressure or vice versa if you're doing environmental testing first um and he acts weird about something that should be inconsequential he will 100 even if he bites he will 100 percent have a problem and i and you know, then it comes down to, is it nature or nurture, right? So a lot of those dogs, then do we test recovery, right? So you show it to them once and they never have a problem with it again. Okay, fine. The dog doesn't have a Rolodex. Like you have to show, then it becomes an issue of creating a list and fucking showing them literally everything, which is Eric's deal, right? Like train above your head so that you don't, so that you're like, when you deploy, it's all, so it's always the most random, stupid shit that is you'll never actually see so that the dog sees everything and if then you can really tell if it's if it's genetic if it's a genetic issue and you show it to them over and over again and they fail routinely it'll always be a problem you can never train around you'll, you'll never be able to train around it you just won't and that dog should not be doing work that exposes him to that whatever yeah. that is so yeah now do you guys through this puppy stuff find that these now these dogs are working all the time right they're getting reps reps building confidence but do these dogs still kind of go through any kind of a fear periods these puppies or do we kind of work right past through that you know like uh, i'm sure you guys have experienced sometimes when you get that that seven eight months of age up to around 11 12 months of age you can go through a bit of a weird phase where they've been super confident they, they've shown really good uh character traits their whole time and Sometimes in those adolescent kind of ages, they will show some weird things and they outgrow it, so to speak. But yeah, that's that, like for the most part, that's when we see it. If you if you test that puppy at seven weeks of age and he's super solid environments, he's not going to develop a problem later on. Not from my experience. Yeah. Now, when you do see kind of that wonky, how do you nurture that? So I'm a big fan of food training, right? So a lot of our environmental training is all food, right? So. The dog, again, uh, some cheesy sayings, but nothing in life is free. So all the work dogs we have and all the puppies we raise, they got to work for their meals. So whether it's on a staircase or aggravate, uh, you know, metal flooring, shiny flooring, whatever it is, uh, they got to earn all their meals and they got to eat those in those environments. So that's, I'm a big fan of the food for training. Yeah. We, we've, I've talked about food and a lot. We've talked about it, how, you know. You said it in um, the last episode, just because you use food doesn't mean you like <clears throat> You will not suddenly like penis if you. There you go. That's the, that. Right. That's yeah. that's the one we need to put on a shirt. Yes. It's still yes. It's still. I still hear it, dude. I still hear it. I still have had trainers or excuse me handlers that have come to me that say my trainer would be fucking furious right now if he knew we were using food, and I'm like, I, I don't get it. I'm like, how old's your trainer? Sixty eight. Well, fucking of course. You know. <laughs> so. I had to say a number way higher than me because I'm 54. So I, like, <laughs> I had to just pick a random number. Um, so anyways, we're going to go ahead and take our first break. Uh, when we get back, we, we kind of did things in reverse. I want to go back and I want to talk about your canine handling career and your dog and kind of get in that a little bit. Um, so guys, we got some great sponsors. Be sure to check them out. Listen to the ads. Uh, Alicia recorded all new ads, so it's not Ted and I's neanderthal fucking voices again saying the same shit over and over alicia actually put some 
thought into the commercials they're like really right. good ted and i are like oh buy this mm. yeah <laughs> fuck you know whatever but anyway <laughs> stick around and uh, there's um discount codes in the show notes uh we got um rex Bex on as a new um new sponsor uh all the you know all of our people have been around ray allen of course uh had to change theirs uh you guys wore out that first um discount code so be sure to look uh for the new one uh in the show notes for ray allen and uh anyway stick around we'll be right back ray allen manufacturing is one of our longest relationships that we've had uh especially me i'm just kidding um we love ray allen they are everything dog and I don't care if you have a pet, the tiniest pet, all the way up to the gnarliest canine. These guys make it. They manufacture their stuff. Matt said back there, hand sewing things. We've seen it. They invent products. They collaborate with other trainers who think that they might have a product that the world needs to see. And they'll make it. They are awesome to work with. They are innovative. Uh, they are professional. They are fantastic to work with. Every one of Torchlight's uh, dual purpose dogs goes with an icon um, vest. They are just, they're fantastic. We order from them all the time. If you guys are looking for a discount code for Ray Allen, please go to rayallen.com and use R-A-M-W-D-R, all caps. That's RAM W-D-R for 10% off. And check out the line of muzzles that I make specifically for them. I think you'll like them. All right, everybody, we are back. Working Dog Radio broadcasting the bite with the coolest name in canine, Jason Bourne. Who's <laughs> never heard that before, is never living that down his whole entire fucking life, thanks to <laughs> movies. I'm gonna um, so when we promote this on Instagram, I'm gonna find that clip for Logan of yeah. the Jesus Christ is Jason Bourne. So <laughs> Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> You here's the thing, brother. You can't suck. Like you, exactly. you cannot. You're fucked. So, anyways, we're here, Jason Board from Psycho Canine, and up in Canada. Um, so we're gonna go back because we skipped over an entire uh, portion of that, and because we wanted to jump into the, we had puppy brain there. Um, so when you get talk about it, you get selected for the unit. So you've been cor doing the quarry work for a little while. I always say it's like prospecting for the Hell's Angels gotta fucking put in your time give me a beer you know that type of shit um the quarries that i saw in vancouver you know that did it were really into it they're they're good folks man i, I liked them um and like you said this free so they're doing it for nothing was one of the kids was he did he have a big goofy mustache i don't remember i know there's a couple girls that were there yeah um one of the kids at the HRD yeah. in Central in in Winnipeg was from out there on the West Coast, and he had, I can't remember his name, and he had a big ass goofy mustache. He's gonna hear this and be like, "You motherfucker!" But yeah, <laughs> I, he was a good kid. God damn it, I can't remember his name. Yeah. He follows I follow him on Instagram, but <laughs> they're a good unit. They're they're yeah. a one and done unit, which I just I hate, man. I I don't, and they don't like it either. But that's just they're kind of stuck in that. So, anyways, let's talk about that when you got selected for the unit. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, late 2008, I got selected to, to to be the puppy handler. I did that. Actually, I raised a Rottweiler puppy from ooh, eight weeks of age. I raised him up to about a year and a half. Uh, man, if I could go back, knowing what I know now, uh, the reason we watched him was tracking, actually. Uh, super nice hunt, really good grips, uh, super cool dog, but uh, our tracking method at the time, uh, he, he could track. He just didn't want to do it. He wasn't very motivated. Um, so I got uh, re-teamed with a, with a Belgian Malinois two weeks before dog class started. Uh, typically in, up here in Canada, our dog classes usually run uh, beginning of April till September. We want to avoid the winter months, obviously, but uh, by luck would have it, when my opening came up, we started training in September. So not a normal time of year for us to start training. So we trained all winter long, uh, 40 below, three feet of snow, you name it. So not ideal, but we, we got through it. No. Um, you didn't have any movie theaters with heat and bath? <laughs> <laughs> Not for tracking. No, that's <laughs> true. That. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I hit the street with him kind of the start of uh, 2011. And I worked him full time till 2014 when just with luck would have it, we were uh, we needed a trainer for our unit. And I kind of got that opportunity a little earlier than I had hoped because we're the same thing. We're a one one dog and done uh, type situation up here. Uh, so a little early to start training, but I started that in 2014 and I did it kind of part time for my first three years where I would run the training class every summer. In the winter months, I would work my own dog. So I kind of had a bit of a balance. 
And then 2017, I retired him. And then I went into a full-time training job where I, I uh, would raise puppies full-time and I would run the training classes all summer long. So I did that until, uh, geez, the end of 2022, I got promoted out of the unit and I'm, uh, I'm actually a patrol. I run a, run a patrol squad right now. And then once I left canine, I started my own company or Zyco canine after yeah. that. So if you had to go back, let's go back to that Rottweiler. Would you, could you have done a tracking differently for his success? Yeah. So I'm lucky. We like here, we're lucky. We get to bring in a lot of good trainers. Um, in 2018, we brought in Dick Stahl, had him here for four days of his tracking class. Ooh. And, um, man, obviously I changed our tracking method. Very, we're not Dick Stahl 100%, but we're very close to what he does. A few things different, of course, to fit your own unit, but, uh, if I could have that Rottweiler back, knowing what I know now with uh, with Dick's method, I'm pretty certain I could have made him a good tracking dog. We've had Dick on, and I use a, and a like a, a version of what he does, and I mix it with hydration tracking, hard surface, and it produces, and along with some e collar stuff, and it produces some dogs that when hide and go seek faux show (laughs) for sure and you can train anything to track as long as it likes food with dick's method so uh and yeah i i can i know exactly what you're talking about um for those listening um we had dick on you can go back and look um and he does an entire um like online video series that you can watch that's done really well. And I, I don't think it's expensive. It was like 10 bucks a month or something, um, or 10 euros or whatever we're in the domination they're using now, but, um, that you can go look at it. It's it, but Dick's a good dude and super, obviously super fucking talented trainer. And that method definitely, I, when you said that, I was like, I wonder if he went and you answered the question. You're like, I wonder if he does the whole Dick's doll thing. And then you're like, yeah, okay. So that makes sense. Yeah, he's, yeah, he, I, I completely understand where you're coming from. So we've talked about uh, people that are in this business understand that uh, Canadians are real big on tracking. I mean, we are too, I guess, but. Yeah, it's that's, fucking big, man. That's what all everybody talks about is <laughs> Canada and their tracking. So, and we'll, we'll get into your Malinois here in a minute, but when you are um, teaching tracking, there seems to be two, two schools of thought on hard surface is you either teach to track on the hard surface. Uh, I see t- a lot of videos of Ted's, especially since you started the hydration tracking, doing a lot of that, or you do more odor pooling, which is kind of what I did. And I, we had very good success with it in the urban environment that we were in. You know, it's a, it's a city, but there people have backyards and there's fucking, there are places that we teach tracking through grass. And, and I taught more odor pooling than, than, um, than, tracking specifically on hard surface where do you guys fall in that no we're definitely more on the tracking side of things um and i've, I've tried everything or not probably not everything but most things i've tried the water hydration does it work 100 percent, it does it worked well for us the only thing i didn't like about it is one more lure i had to get rid of at some point right so it's going to take me more time to phase that out uh, before dick's method i did that i did uh, the hard surface i actually talk about the puppies i did an experiment uh we, we took three puppies one time in the winter months here, not good to train. So we went to heated parkades, the, the parking garages, and I trained dogs uh, on the hydration all winter long uh, in these heated garages on the with the uh, hydration tracks. And then come spring, grass, grass is there. I went for a test, took them out, then took them to the grass, and they hooked the track like nothing. So mm-hmm. that method definitely does work too. But after having Dick here and adopting, you know, his method, I got away from the from the hydration just because with the – with the washer method and, and getting that focus and that intensity to put your nose down, I don't feel we need to use the hydration anymore. Yeah. I I've played around with it. Um, you know, and again, I, I teach, uh, tracking. I, I start in grass, um, and we've had great success at it. So I just keep doing that. You know, um, I have messed with the, the, uh, the hydration, but I just walked, you know, got away from it and just, again, for hard surface, I taught more, you know, odor pulling with the wind and the way it, you know, picks up. Cause I still believe in tracking. I, I think trailing is, uh, I don't think it's very successful myself. I do tracking, teach the dog tracking. And then I teach area searches separately. And I believe the dog then puts the two together and you get there, how you get there. Um, uh, I talk to a lot of search and rescue people, for example, that do a lot of, they're big on trailing trail 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 i just don't think it's that successful um tracking wise we have numbers like 
piles and piles of piles of numbers. One of the dogs in my department had 175 street bites and a hundred of those were from tracking, tracking, not trailing, tracking. No, there's no SAR people that have a hundred fines. Well, granted, they're not getting called out like we are, but I just think if they may, if they would go back and start doing more tracking, they would have a lot more success than just the trailing. But the, you know, the other thing about the Dick method, the, the Dick Stall method, that I think um, thank helps. you for clarifying. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> it's like I'm dragging my dick along. Yeah, the Dick Stall method is uh, the evidence recovery, which is super valuable. Um, it's kind of an underrated skill, I think, and integrating it into the tracking side ends up creating dogs that like like Jason just said, are super intense and looking for something and they're constantly looking for something and the ability to find that stuff. um, My guys are super successful at it and have helped recover evidence that has helped with convictions. It has helped with charges that has helped with all these other things. And there's the study that goes around that kind of comes up every couple of years about the DOJ saying, what is it, Eric? Like 22% of tracks or like 13, like way lower. Or, yeah, it's low. Uh, then the DOJ in the United States said that only like 30, like let's just say 20% of tracks when law enforcement are successful and they determine success by you find the person you're looking for and or the right person or whatever it is. And everyone knows listening to this, like they get picked up by the homeboys or they get picked up by the girlfriend or whatever. And the dog's not incorrect. Like that's just, they're just not there to find. And that's not the dog's fault. And it doesn't mean it wasn't a successful track, but during that you could find evidence, you could find something that links the person to the flight path, or you could then find the flight path that runs in front of a ring cam, which happened to one of my guys recently. And they were able to place somebody near the scene of a crime because they tracked him to a pickup and found evidence and had, I think three ring cams that people turned over. Like they went and they just like the ring sent them the, the stuff, like people that had said, you know, you can use my audio and my video. They're like, Oh yeah, here's the time. Here's the dude running. Here's what he's wearing. Here's a car he got into. And I'm like, Oh, and they would have never have had that had they not had the dog, but they didn't ring find him. cameras have solved more fucking crimes in the last <laughs> yeah. like, oh, five, I know. six years. <laughs> yeah, dude. Like, you can't, you can't anymore no. do anything. So, yeah, you know, and that percentage has to with the advent with cell phones and cars that, you know, that 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 percentage of success has to go, you know, way, way down. So. All right. So you get this Malinois. Is it Zyko is the Malinois? Yeah, you betcha. And uh, how old was he when you got him? A little older, like for our program, because you're one and done. We try and buy the dogs hit the street around 18 months to hit the class. Mm-hmm. But my guy was actually three years old. So oh, huh? shit. he kind of came, kind of came to us a little bit late in his life, but uh, yeah, he was a fun dog to work. That's that. And I'm just going to uh, irritate it here a little bit. For some reason, man, these departments, three years old is ancient. And I'm like, three is sweet, man. They're like the Leonardo DiCaprio's of the dog world. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, you know, when, no, when he date, no, seriously, once Leonardo DiCaprio, oh, yeah, like yeah. any chick he's dating, hits 25, he's got to break up with her because they're too old. Yeah. Exactly. So three years yeah. old and like. Three oh, years old is 25 in the Leonardo DiCaprio world. He's three and a half. Oh my God. He'll die. Yeah, come on, man. <laughs> yeah. I have three years old is sweet, man. That's Meanwhile, there's age. some dudes still driving Crown Vicks. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> so he's 18 months. You get into school with him. How's it go? Uh, you know what? Um, it, it went because I was kind of behind the eight ball. Like, so uh, normally we, we would have a ton of puppy tracks, we would call them, right? Into the dog before class starts. Like um, back then, most of our dogs, um, when they're hitting class, they're already doing 800 yard tracks, seven corners on the field. Like they're, they're blazing. Whereas I, I got them two weeks before class and man we maybe had 10 or 12 tracks in before class started so it, it was a struggle like it, it was not easy with the track and the biting side of things yeah that was that was pretty easy it was a malinois and he was serious mm-hmm. uh the tracking was a struggle like it, it took a long time and then the snow hit not ideal for training right so it was a struggle and that's where you know what the, the following spring um i used the hydration hydration method on the hard surface because he wasn't putting his nose down right so tried some different things and and got some progress but yeah it, it was it was a tough grind to start but i think it worked out after putting the work in where does edmonton fall in the, the in canada as far as uh snowfall like are you guys real heavy or average or 
Uh, we're probably average. Like this year was a little bit lighter, but you know, an average winter, you're going to get a few feet for sure. Like three, four feet over the winter. Ted just threw up. Just no. <laughs> nipples. <laughs> no. Got cold, like cold chill. He's got goosebumps over there. Fuck that. He said it was 80 at his place today. Yeah, like, it was 80 today. Oh, I was sweating. I'm not good with the uh, conversion of Celsius to Fahrenheit, but I think today it was like 12 degrees Fahrenheit. So a little chilly. 12 is cold Fahrenheit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Period. Fuck me. This um, is spring. <laughs> when so i always say in ohio that right when it first gets cold we uh the police get slow until the criminals get their winter puffy coat uniforms out of the attic and get their blood kind of used to it do you have that law in canada or are they just fuck it we're still going to do dumb shit uh, they will slow down on those really cold winter nights but mm-hmm. if you have four or five of those cold ones in a row when it finally gets warm on day six they're going like it's then they, get, up. they get fucking hammered and go out and do hood rat shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah. Exactly. Cabin fever. We're, <laughs> we're going into hood rat season right now where, you know, we get nights in the 50 degree range and dudes can run around in just hoodies and not jackets anymore. And yeah, there <laughs> it, it's getting, it sounds like Chirac outside. So uh, it, <laughs> yeah, there was a gunshot slot near my house last night. It was like, Oh, it's, it's hood rat season. <laughs> people getting carjacked and shit so yeah it's definitely tis the season <laughs> so once you get uh once you graduate and you're hitting on the road and you're working him for a little while well let's just say overall his whole career what did you really like and what did you not like about that dog oh boy i guess the biggest thing i liked was the uh the will to work right uh, anytime he came out of the truck he was ready to go 100 percent um yeah the will to work was was more than i could ask for tons of drive um, and, and the flip side, I guess, the thing I didn't like is sometimes that drive can get in your way a little bit too, right? So yeah. luckily he wasn't an asshole to me, but uh, he uh, he was a lot of dogs. So at, at times as a new guy, that was a struggle, right? Trying to, as a new guy, trying to catch up to a dog that's three and a half years old, um, that, that took some time. That that yeah. was definitely a struggle. Yeah, you got a man on the end of that leash at that point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he's got he's got mental problems. So... <laughs> You called him Zyko the Psycho? Yeah, that was kind yeah. of a running joke in the unit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like it. So how was his career overall? Did he uh, – did uh, I? Did you work him longer than normal because it was only – you were training and then working and training and then working? Like, did he last longer than you would have expected? I worked him until 2016, 2017, so that was – yeah, that put him around nine, ten years of age, right? So yeah, that's not bad. Um, yeah. It wasn't bad that way for, for that side of things. Yeah, he was, he was pretty healthy until then for sure. He was rocking and like was retirement tough. Well, uh, luckily being the trainer, I got a lot of reps with him in still too, right? So oh, we okay. hit the sod farms in class, and at the end of the the day at the sod farms, I made sure you got at least one track a day just to try and keep him active, keep that brain going. So sometimes yeah. there's a benefit of being the trainer. Talk to the Americans about tracking in sod farms. That is the bread and butter. It's funny you mention that. So I do put on tracking seminars, right? And my seminars are they're Dick Stahl's method. That's what I teach. Um, and I've done a few in the States here now. And the first thing I do when I get there, I ask them where the sod farms are and, uh, and nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for me, that's the bread and butter. That's where you got to start. Uh, not only for the dog, but also for the hunter. That's when you teach fundamentals. If you think you can teach fundamentals in an urban setting to a brand new handler, man, that's asking a lot, right? Yeah. So we like to perfect it all on the, on the sod farms. Our, we're lucky up here. Our training class is 20 weeks long, right? We get lots of time. Uh, but those first, those first seven, eight weeks, uh, every morning we're at the sod farms for four or five hours a day, just getting the fundamentals, building the dog and the handler. Yeah. When I first took over, well, I was a handler. And then when I took over as trainer, our classes were 14 weeks long. And so you got, you know, another six weeks. By the time we graduated, I was so effing sick of those dudes and they were completely sick of me. Like, I know it. Like, I can't listen to their voice, and they can't listen to my voice any longer. You kind of feel like that? Uh, like, the best day is the last day? Yeah, it's it's a grind, right? Like, I always tell the guys in day one of dog class, like, we all know when you go through academy, or what do you, what do you guys call it, academy, a police academy? That's a grind. That's hard, right? Mm-hmm. But I always tell the guys in day one of dog class, this is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life, right? 20 weeks in a van, dogs working working your tail off. There's nothing harder. Ted, were you ever, did you guys ever, when you started Green Dog, Green Handler, was it always pre-train, then bring the handler in? Uh, It was always bring, I've done a couple that were um, Green Dog, Green Handler, and they're fucking miserable. Um, But I much prefer the pre-training. 
Um, because if you don't, if, well, but in, in Jason's program, right? Like they have the benefit of raising these dogs from most of them anyway, from puppyhood. So you kind of have some predictability going on, but like, if I get green dog, green handler, some of these dogs I get in from Europe, like I get them out with a goddamn catch pole at the Houston <laughs> airport because they're trying to fucking destroy me. I can't hand that dog to a green handler. Like I just, yeah. there, there's no, like, I mean, it, that won't happen. Um, so I much prefer the, um, a dog that's a little older, um, that doesn't have bad habits, uh, that has a little bit of good foundation and, and we do a lot of the pre-training on and then finish it during school so that I can focus on because our schools are in Oklahoma, uh, where I'm at, we, uh, January 1st, we started a, a program, um, in the state where, to even get, we have a mandatory state certification and to get your ability to even test, you have to complete a 160 hour course, which is still like fairly short. It's a month. Um, but I want that month to train the handler. So, you know, I need the dog for the most part, pretty much done so that I'm not troubleshooting and fucking around and like trying to deal with that shit. Um, so it just makes the training of the handler so much smoother, um, and versus like trying to do the fucking 16 to 20 week deal where, you know, and, and I, there's still people that do that. And there's still a great efficacy for it because you produce handlers that are very good and you produce dogs that are very good, but it requires the right person and it requires the right dog. And that doesn't always fucking happen. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, I I don't mind. I mean, month is good. I month to six weeks for a pre-trained dog seems to be kind of like the sweet spot. Um, and I'm under no illusions, and I tell people, I'm like, you know, you're done, you're certified, but you're not even like you you are not confident yet. So you need to continue to train, and they have a whole lesson yeah. plan that they follow for like the next six to eight months, and there's a whole thing. But um, I feel like you know, we're caught between a rock and a hard place on that one. And, you know, so we do as much of the pre-training as we can and, uh, or well, we pretty much finish the dogs. Like they're already rocking tracks. They're doing, they out, the obedience is good. Uh, I make the handlers do obedience during school, uh, with food. Right. And nobody, yeah. nobody, I haven't had anyone decide that they are going to switch teams and become gay or straight, I guess, whatever. Um, because I've had them trained with food during school hasn't happened yet. When it does happen, I'll let everybody know. Um, so, and they're expected to do the, the obedience training, um, during class. Um, so the dogs are kind of loose on obedience, but by the end they're usually pretty good. But, um, yeah, the, the 16 week program, the green dog, green handler thing, especially if you have a dog, that's a fucking man eater is rough because, yeah. Handlers get bit, instructors get bit. Like I've got scars from those, like mental and physical. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so before we take our next commercial break, there's there's some myths about Canadian police work or Canadian canine work in the states, and it's that you guys have no crime and everybody's nice and you don't do shit. <laughs> do you? Would you like to take a minute to to dispel some okay. of that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, like we're in Edmonton here, we're we've, we're over a million population wise now, and uh, with our uh, we'll call it a catch and release program, um, we're busy. Like uh, it's a violent city. We have a big gun problem right now. Uh, lots of shootings, lots of gang problems. Uh, it's it's a super busy city. Yeah, it's. The you guys got some weird foreign gangs too, like yeah, doing yeah, hits, like paid Chinese hits and shit up there. And and crazy yeah. shit. Yeah. Indonesian folks and uh, what were yeah. they telling me? And then they have Native American gangs like we do too here in Oklahoma. You guys have the fucking yeah. Native gangs, which are gnarly as well. The one thing that I think is interesting, every time I'm up there, it always shocks me because in the United States, we have a case that is applicable to all law enforcement um, the deals with you, the force is Graham versus Connor. So, Graham, I mean, yep. right. Yep. So when I'm in Canada, they're like, yeah, we don't do that. So they're like, okay, well, what's your bite? What's your, like, what's your threshold for a bite? They're like, if you're arrestable, you're biteable. I'm like, fuck. Okay. So we start building searches. I'm like, ah, oh, they're here illegally. They're like, perfect. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and that's the thing. They're like, oh, there's no crime. I'm like, the fuck there's not. They buy people for stealing candy bars up there. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like it. Uh, when we, when I was in Vancouver, I, I, I listen and I know some of them listen to the podcast. I give them so much credit because they have a, um, the crown over there, the prosecutor's office has three people whose entire job is to go after cops. 
It's all their job air is to prosecute cops. And the, and those Vancouver handlers are biting people. And yeah, they are. And, yeah. and, and so I give them props to them, man. Cause you know, that would destroy a lot of people, you know? Um, so cool. Good to, uh, you guys listen. They're not all just super nice up there. Uh, there's got a lot of problems. <laughs> no. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of problems, but uh, good, good folks. Anyways, we're going to take our second commercial break. When we talk, we're going to come back. We're going to talk about Zyko K9. I'd like to get into some uh, philosophy stuff with you a little bit about uh, where you land on some things and, and what your approach to, to stuff like that is. So stick around. We get back. Um, don't fast forward the commercials, please. I know you will, but please don't. We'll be right back. Every year for the past four years, our guys have instructed at HITS. HITS Canine Conference this year is going to be in the Big Easy, guys. It's going to be in New Orleans, and I'm really excited about that. It's going to be August 26th through 29, 2024. It is packed to the brim with the world's best instructors in covering the most important canine topics. There is no better place to learn. There's no better place to network. If you guys want to meet, greet, and shake hands and grab a beer with everything who's canine, everybody who's canine, this is the place to go. You need to hit Jeff Barrett at 863 529 5113. Go to hitsk9.net and get signed up. Don't miss that. Don't miss out on this one, guys. Come buy us a beer. We would love to see you. Come shake our hands. We'll have stuff at the booth for you. We'll see you at Hits. All right, everybody. We are back. Working Dog Radio, broadcasting the bite. Hope you enjoyed the Alicia's uh, great uh, commercial thing that was the, probably the best idea ted and i had in a long time was like hey how about you record these exactly because i'm tired of listening to myself <laughs> you know she's Honestly. the one at the beginning of the episode at the beginning of every episode it's like working dog radio broadcasting the bite and mm-hmm. then static who's now passed away her dog is bark 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 that's her dog so yeah um, i forgot about static to be yeah one. static yeah. But, so we're here with uh jason Bourne from psycho canine so you're up there you're working you get promoted. Now they gave you a lobotomy, of course, after you got promoted. <laughs> Took you out of canine. And then, like a lot of guys, um, you're a dog guy, right? So you're a dog guy through and through. You also realize that there's a a good market, a good, you know, a way to um, make some money without being in your uniform. You know, uh, it can be a little tough working and still doing the business because growth can be pretty exponential and it, it can be tough. So, you're doing both. No, well, I shouldn't say that. You're doing the pet side for the training, but uh, on the police side, are you just offering seminars and things like that? Or are you housing police dogs? No, uh, because I am still a full time copper. I am uh, just doing the seminars. Uh, when I retire, I might uh, I might start raising some puppies for police work. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as of right now, for my law enforcement side, I help uh, obviously help the guys here when I can, and I do these uh, these uh, canine law enforcement seminars as well. So. What is your specialty at the seminars? Like this year, what are you working on? Tracking mostly? So, yeah, last year I did four tracking seminars and uh, the, those were really good. This year I got, what I got booked so far? Three seminars, mm-hmm. uh, one tracking and two are actually going to be more muzzle, bite work, uh, hunt, some capping, uh, all those types of things. Oh, cool. So I, I've told, and Ted and I talk about this and all the things that we teach is that I tell guys, um, they're like, fuck that. I'm not fucking trained in no bullshit doodle pet dog. I can't, the owners, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. And and I tell them all, if you want to be a better police dog trainer, train pet dogs. Um, What do you, what do you do? We'll just say obedience wise that are similar and different between the two. Uh, well, like you, like you said, um, like, to, let's be honest. You get a super nice genetic dog for, for, for working dog for law enforcement it's not that hard to train yeah, right it's easy uh, right? Yeah. it's pretty easy when it, when the genetics are good you're buying these super strong dogs um you go and visit the pet that's maybe a little overweight not much interest in food or toys or nothing else now that's a challenge right um for me though again i use food for training that's my my common between law enforcement and and pet dogs everything's food um i show up to the to my client's house i got my food pouch on right um it's just a chalk pouch full of food but i have that i have, i'll have it some maybe some toys on me but um, definitely the, the, the similarities are, uh, for me, belief is the biggest thing, right? Um, 
if you expect your dog to do anything, there ha- the dog has to have a belief that something good's going to come for them. And it doesn't matter if it's a pet or if it's a working dog. The dog has to have belief, and that's your job is to build that. So are you doing mostly lessons, or you do board and trains, or a mixture of everything? What are you doing? Right now, just lessons. Board and trains, I don't have the time for. So I am uh, I do all private one-on-one at the client's house. Um, mm-hmm. The first session is an evaluation with a lot of training inside there, and then usually follow up with three more lessons is kind of, especially if they want to learn uh, e-collar, mm-hmm. that's going to take at least three more lessons. I just, so we do mostly board and trains. I have, I don't know, man, eight or nine trainers. I can't remember off the top of my head right now. So it's all board and trains. I am the one doing the lessons and it's because the trainers don't want to do them. And uh, I started doing lessons actually only for uh, aggression cases where I could not physically touch the dog they owners put the collars on and everything like that and do all that stuff. And then if it, if we work through it a little bit, maybe we switch them over to a board and train. One of the things that, and I, so talk about your philosophy, you have it on your website, um, but talk about kind of your philosophy when it comes to the pet side, we'll do the pet side first. Yeah. When it comes to the pet side, like I, I use operant conditioning, right? I'm a big believer in that. Um, I teach everything through positive, right? Uh, generally speaking, when, when I'm teaching behaviors, it's all through positive. Uh, once those behaviors are known, though, I got to use all four quadrants and I got to get reliability, right? Um, I, there's, a, there's a big push out there of if you're positive only or balanced or all these different labels that are being put out there. But I do I use consequences, right? Mm-hmm. If a dog knows a behavior and they don't do it, well, it's, there's got to be a consequence at some point. And some behaviors you're not going to stop without consequence, right? Uh, a behavior that's reinforced is going to be repeated. And a behavior that's going to have a consequence, it's going to be diminished. Like it's, that's such a push simple. here recently. <laughs> and when we had, um, I'm, if you listen to the show, we had Pat Stew on um, and uh, Greg from uh, from Australia. And Pat's a fucking super talented yeah. trainer. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, he's uh, and he's a great instructor. And um, Australia's got a weird deal like with like uses of e-collars. And we had Steve on with Stephen Cooge, like, and he was a handler for their SAS guys and had to have an exemption from like some government official, like an elected official in their parliament to use a goddamn e-collar for a, just because we're mili- stationed. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that shit is, and in the United States, you know, there's a push now in the United States for everyone listening, everyone, if you live here, you know this, but if you don't live here and you're listening to this, they're like, Oh, we're going to ban e-collars nationally. I'm like, we don't even have a national fucking speed limit. We don't have a national <laughs> caliber for law enforcement. We don't even have a national language. Like the banning of e-collars or pinch collars or whatever at the level uh, at the national level is never going to happen. It's just not like it's just not a thing like the FDA is not going to step in and regulate it. The USDA is not going to step in and regulate because they don't give a shit. They're too worried about COVID vaccinations. So we're like, we're not like, it's never going to be a thing no matter how much. And I just refuse to engage with those people. Like if they're positive only, I just don't because, and Eric will tell you the same thing where he lives and where I live. Like when the aggression cases is we're one of the few balanced training facilities in the state in this area anyway, because we have some guys that are from huge brands that um, have like franchises and they'll slap an e-collar on a dog before they get out, before the owners get out of a parking lot. And just, you know, use escape training and just push, 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 push. Um, And then there are trainers that will literally try and positive reinforcement their way out of severe, like, resource aggression. And, like, I mean, real shit. So, um, and I'm unabashed about it. And um, I don't care. Like, if they want to train that way, that's fine. But the trick is, there is nothing that we won't take. And that's the trick. And I'm sure you're the same way based on your action. Eric's the same way. There is no dog that I will turn down. If you bring me this dog, you know, piss fingers, the third only can eat when it's a full moon and has to, you know, eat in a, in an orchard of like 400 year old, like peach trees. And he's super dog aggressive. Like we'll take it. And, but I've got a lot of local trainers that will turn that down. And they're like, Oh, he can't be trained. And I'm like, Oh, watch me. And so we'll do it. And we use positive reinforcement. We, we use offer conditioning and we use all four quadrants and I'm unabashed about it. And I don't care if you don't like it. If you're listening to this and you don't like it, go get <laughs> fucking hit by a bus. I don't care. <laughs> Stop training dogs. Like, <laughs> so when we are talking to at my seminars, I always tell guys like, I'm like, listen, how many of you guys train pet dogs? Nobody raises their hand. Maybe one guy. And I'm like, listen, guys, I'm telling you, you're, you're, you're taking years off your life by living in your uniform extra job, side job, side job, overtime, 
pushing, pushing, pushing. When you could sit in a fucking lawn chair with a clicker and a bag of food and flip flops and make real money, but a beer, right? But what I tell them is the reason, and and there's based on something you put on your website. I want to talk to you about it. What I tell them is the reason why, like working dogs are so much easier because their motive, you know, their motivation, what they'll work for. I said, but no pet dogs will work for a toy. They'll work for food or pressure that the removal of pressure for those ones that don't do it. I said, so when you start to understand and learn actual pressure, which sounds counterintuitive to most people are like, well, the dog's afraid and you're using pressure. Yes. The overcoming of pressure is reward, blah, blah, blah. However, one thing I saw on your website that, that pet trainers specifically forget, and this is where working dog trainers could jump in is they is um, play. Like we're, yeah. we're, so we're doing, you know, in my building, each trainer has five dogs, rep, 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 rep. And we forget the importance of play. And I see that in your, like on your website, you specifically mention how do you work to that? Where do you get to, especially on the kind of the weirdo little dogs and how important do you find that to be? You know, it's uh, super important. You get these doodles or whatever that are skittish and they're afraid of different people. Uh, the ones I've come across uh, with time, again, I, I'm a big fan of the flirt pole, right? Uh, whatever toy that they like the most, I put it on the end of that flirt pole and just start playing in the yard. Uh, it takes time, right? Nothing's nothing's fixed overnight. There ain't a one hour fix, but through play, I've I've definitely brought a lot of a lot of confidence out of out of a lot of dogs, right? And all that play, all that play builds engagement, and it, it, all it does is strengthen your relationship with your dog, whether it's a work dog or a pet, right? Um, you're, you're enhancing your relationship with your dog and you, you're going to get way more out of your dog with that relationship. Yeah. It's funny. He, he mentioned, I had to go find my flirt pole. Um, <laughs> we got a greyhound puppy in yesterday and my train, my one trainer goes, I just thought greyhounds were always 10 years old. I've never seen a greyhound. Puppy. <laughs> they're just delivered at 10 years <laughs> yeah. old. Like they're, they're like, you know but, what? I've never seen a greyhound puppy. <laughs> and so my wife has rescued four or five racing greyhounds over the years. And, and in this country, it's not a thing anymore because um, Florida and West Virginia banned dog racing, but you can still get them out of Ireland, I guess. Oh, out of Europe. There's, a, there's some racing going on up there, but um I, we've, we've had a bunch of them. We have one right now. He's 13 years old. I've never seen one. I've never seen a greyhound puppy. That's a good um, point. Yeah. Never trained yeah, one. Good point. Yeah. Four months old, screams in the crate and pisses everywhere. So I'm like, <laughs> we're getting the, it's day two, but I'm like, we're going to get the flirt pole out for him. He's, now that you uh, mention it, I've never seen a greyhound puppy. <laughs> right. I'm saying <laughs> fucking 20 something years training dogs. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, I've never you're right. I've never seen a greyhound puppy. Do you, do you find, (laughs) yeah. So when I'm explaining things to owners, I'll tell them, you know, the ones that are petting and cuddling their dogs so much. I said, the mother leads, feeds, cleans, and corrects, leads, feeds, cleans, corrects, no coddling. However, she does play with the dogs a little bit. Do you find any value in play, um, with any kind of fear, aggression or reactivity, anything like that? Do you try to get to a point with those dogs with that? 100%. 100%. Yeah, the reactivity, again, new to the pet world, only a year and a half or whatever. I'm learning a lot, and I never realized how many reactive problem dogs that mm-hmm. we actually have out there. You take for granted the environmental stability oh. of working dogs, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you did. Like totally, standing on the side yeah. of the road at 3 o'clock in the morning running odor and the dog not being scared of shit versus the dog literally being scared of everything. And you're like, I don't even know what to do with this motherfucker. Like, <laughs> Exactly. Yes. But where I can, yeah, that like I'll build that toy, the play and the toy. I'll build that up and and I'll give that dog an option later on. Once we're out walking and there's a dog across the street, well, the option is you can play with me, or if you want to go and get across the street and try and dog fight, well, we're going to use some pressure, mm-hmm. right? And you give the dog those two options, most times they're going to learn that playing with you is a lot more fun. Yeah, and guys, if you're getting into the pet dog world, give yourself some time before you start getting the reactive dogs. Um, work some fearful dogs first, like dogs that are just a little skittish and scared because reactivity is a problem and, and you got to understand what causes all that. But I tell everybody, man, the Did most it. important thing for those dogs is movement. Movement is life. Yeah. Get them off the X. Don't stop. Yeah. Don't and, and I'm telling yeah. people this because <laughs> all of you guys that are listening to handlers, every one of you have had family members and friends that have come to you to ask for help with their dog because you're the only dog expert that they know. And if you're in Florida, everyone that has an alligator in their yard asks you to come get it because you're the dog guy. Right. <laughs> and you're like, fuck, what? Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so take your time and slow roll it, guys. By the time you retire, if you uh, are going well, you can have a nice, nice little business going. And again, it will make you uh, better. Also, some of you dudes with working dogs have reactive dogs. Uh, yeah. And your dogs have anxiety. I, I, I hate to tell you, some of your dogs have anxiety. And it's a big part of my e-collar without conflict or removing conflict seminar <laughs> is shut up. I could just change the name of the thing. Shut Those up. Those listening, excessive barking, spinning, fucking bloody tails, tearing bowls up. Is anybody listening to this sound like shit? <laughs> trying to break their teeth on fucking kennels. Like chasing fucking water while you're trying to clean the goddamn kennel. Like, does any of this sound familiar to you people? Yeah. That's that not is because they're man- psycho Malinois. I mean, <laughs> well, they could be a psycho Malinois, <laughs> but you're right. Like Ted, Ted's right. All that stuff that we're talking about. And I dealt with that as a handler and I didn't know any of that stuff. I had my second dog, Willie drove me fucking insane. Like a crazy person <laughs> in the back of the car for eight fucking hours. Now he'd fight Godzilla in the dark, but he was afraid of thunderstorms and fucking fireworks and would kill me on gunfire. And you know, there's so many different things that you could be fixing um, if you really just kind of learned and understood. And, it, you know, the, the precursors for that type of anxiety or however we're paraphrasing it for like the human eye, the anthropomorphizing, um, those precursors for working dogs, it just so happens that well-selected working dogs, that their reaction to those stressors are usually to fuck it, fight it, or kill it. And for pets is to just run or shut mm-hmm. down completely but the but the the leading indicators that the dog is going into that is, are all the same and the reactions are the same now obviously or not the, the reactions are not the same because we have one side or the other we have two ends of the spectrum but the way that we desensitize and the way that we and it's the same thing like with police dogs movement is life when we have a dog that wants to fucking it will not cap that will have this overstimulated you're like move dude like do something and how many times eric have we told handlers like give him something to fucking do tell him to down tell him to heal or give him a toy something right versus you know pet dogs are like look you know how to heal you know how to turn the e-collar off you know you know how to get a reward so do that rather than freak the fuck out about the dump truck going by or whatever is causing their anxiety at that point and yeah you learn real quick that you know with the exception of shiba inus it's pretty straightforward those dogs are like cats um (laughs) they hate people they don't want to be touched they go on hunger strikes um, you learn really quick that those that this, the problems are the same and the 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 outcome and the process of handling that is typically very similar for, you know, our police dogs and then the pet side. But you'll get really good at it because every dog that comes in with an anxiety problem is always fostered and reinforced by the owners and mm-hmm. they get stronger and stronger and stronger. And they think they're helping and their heart's in the right place. And I get it, but <laughs> like, I know your heart's in the right place, but stop doing this. Right. And handlers, I have to tell people that all the time. I'm like, I know your heart's in the right place, but fucking knock it off. Mm-hmm. Like, leave So the fucking what, slider what did you part. start doing in the pet world where you like light bulb and fucking took it over to the working dog world? You know, like, uh, because I did all the working dog stuff first, I think I, I brought a lot more from the working dog into the pet world. Um, I think the biggest thing for me in the pet world, uh, I've learned to, how to teach people a lot better because uh, these are these are people that have a regular pet. They're not striving to be a, a, a dog handler, right? Um, so I think I've improved my teaching skills the most from teaching pet owners and then bringing that back to the law enforcement for sure. Yeah, my number one thing I think I took, I learned really from the pet word that I took over was take your dog, if you got problems, take your dog out of that 10 by 20 kennel and put him in a crate. Just shrink his world for a while and teach him to lay down on a dog bed for hours. We'll fix a lot of your problems. Shrink his world. Yeah, Yeah, and just teach your, (laughs) we're not teaching place to my fucking working dog. Dude, Uh, it it works, wait you, man. Wait till you have to do a shield press into an attic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Place yeah. command is super important at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so, and one more thing is that on your website, you have a, an interesting way of wording if you have a pro- behavioral problems on a dog. Not behavioral modification. He calls it, re- is it reduction? Or how do you word it on the web? You word it a way if you want. Um, Redu- I think reduce unwanted reduce, reduce unwanted yeah. behavior. Yeah, that's probably the first pet website that I've seen use that term. 
Um, everybody else says, some people will say correct, a limit, eliminate, fix, that type of stuff. Reduce is a pretty good, I mean, there's no question what you're talking about. Like if you read it, you went reduce. Does that mean make, make it less or can it go away? And maybe that gets them inquisitive to call you and go, what are you, what are you talking about with that? Yeah. Like, like you said earlier, genetics, right? Um, there's only so much we're going to change. And, and we, a lot of times when it comes to reactivity and different things, some of it is making it manageable, right? So that's where you're reducing that reactivity. Um, I know I worked with a, with a shepherd here. Oof, he, he was a challenge. Uh, reactive times a hundred, right? Um, can I totally change that dog's genetics? I don't think so, but I've reduced, I've reduced those behaviors to where he's a manageable dog now. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the best way to describe that. Ted tells people that when they say their dog loves him, he goes, if you died in your house, your dog will eat you. So he, he, he's not allowed to talk to clients anymore. Yeah. So. I, yeah. I, I deal with cops I, in, where, I can, where I can be very frank with them yeah. and pet people. I'm like, you can't do that. I mean, we have, we're training a deaf pit bull right now that has been fun. Right. So mm -hmm. if you do positive reinforcement only, like how do you, how do you mark, how do you click, how do you, yeah. how, and so all of a sudden, like because for the people that are positive reinforcement trainers there, I'm like, how do you train a deaf pit bull? I mean, it has to be a tactical, or not tactile, tactile, tactile like yeah. thing, right? Like, so we used a like e collar, it like set it like a five for our clicker. So anytime you nick that dog at a five, she comes mocking back to you, expecting a treat. And I'm like, yeah, it's cool. Solves yeah, it's recall fun. and everything all at once. <laughs> and then yeah. same thing, silent recall and vibrate. The only trick is you got to stand still. So if you like, if because she knows where you're at, right? So if you vibrate and you're not there, she's like, well, fuck, I don't know where you are. So I'm going to go back to doing what I'm doing. And I'm like, yeah, it's, and I still talk to her too. And I mean, I'm not big on talking to dogs and I've trained other deaf ones before. And I always find myself talking to them. I'm like, I, you, I know you can't hear me. It makes me feel better. But mm -hmm. like, I don't, I mean, I don't know. And she's great. I always she's teach this as good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Oh right. My God. So um, if somebody wanted to uh, bring you down for a tracking seminar to the States, what, uh, how do they get a hold of you? But more importantly, what do they kind of need for you to get there? Like space, what, what do you need? Cause, and I, I ask because like, I have people ask me about training. Can you do a tracking seminar? I'm like, listen, I can teach a tracking seminar, but logistically I've never done one. So I, I don't know. So I just refer them to other people that have done it. Yeah, like my seminars are three days. Um, that first day, we're, we're a blend of classroom and we're doing practical reps. And it's a big stall method. We're, we're starting off with a food bowl for that first session, right? And we're moving away to a, you know, a soup can lid and working our way down washer-wise. Um, the first few sessions, we're going to start inside in our little Skinner box, right? Small room, no distractions. Um, from there, we're going to work ourselves out to a parking lot. Um, hopefully by the second day, we're going to, we're going to have that down to, a, you know, a single nail or a, a super small washer, uh, in the parking lot. And from there, we're going to go to grass. Uh, the third day, I definitely like to have a sod field, something similar to that. Cause by that third day now we're, we'll be doing straight line tracks and, and having multiple washers on the track and showing that reinforcement. And, and again, in the seminars, I have, I do have enough videos and, and when I leave the seminar, everybody gets a manual and it, it shows you from week one to week 20, what you need to do. So, um, the seminars that I have done, right. It's awesome to get updates two, three, four months down the road. And they're, they're cruising along in their student manual and they're sending you videos of the progress of where they've made. And, and they're making five, six, seven, eight corners on these, on these field tracks. And now they're tracking in the city. So yeah, that's, that, that's how I do that. And you've been able to, uh, and I, I'm pretty sure Ted, you've used it too, to use that Dick Stahl type method to correct issues, problems that people have been created over the time. Yeah. Yeah. My biggest thing with correcting issues is the initial, and it's always like everything else is the initial imprinting phase of like what we're teaching the dog to visit, to actually do, like, what are we actually teaching them to do? And, you know, at, at that point, um, are we actually teaching them to find human odor? Like what the, in, you know, we're making a nominal odor important and that I think gets lost a lot of times. And then there's a lot of mistakes that I see happen in like old methods of tracking or like, I guess mean, not old, just not modern. I don't know how you want to say it, but that focus a lot on 
I don't know. I call it witchcraft because it's like a focus on a bunch of shit. And when people describe it to me, I'm like, okay, so when we're talking about this, like, what the fuck do I see? Like, what am I looking at? Like, how can I tell that the dog is at this point in this program based on change of behavior and body language or whatever else? And I get some fucking weird ass answer. And I'm like, and I just kind of think to myself, I'm like, if you can't explain this in like one sentence, you don't fucking understand it. And yeah. so the dick stall method is like the, you know, the article method is like a very, it, I mean, and it makes sense because it's what we do with narcotics and explosives. I mean, you know, you have a source emitting odor. It's just, you're changing the venue and you're changing the odor. I mean, it's not fucking rocket science. And, you know, and that's why it's always interesting to me when I do, when I've done tracking seminars and I'm like, dudes that are like, oh, he doesn't like to track. I'm like, but he does building searches really well. Right. And they're like, yeah. I'm like, you know, it's the same odor. And they look at me. And they kind of confused them like, it, it, <laughs> d- dude, it's the same fucking odor. And you just haven't, the dog hasn't connected the dots of where he's likely to be successful. There's a reason every dog that does narcotics work sticks their nose on door handles every search. It's because that's where they're always fucking successful. <laughs> so it has a lot to do with teaching the dog where it's successful, how to be successful, and how to be independent of the handler. And I think that's a lot of where, and then too, I see a lot of handler mistakes too, like, um, one of my Tedisms is I'm like, I, you've probably got a three inch dick because you've got a 30 feet of line and you're really good at only using three feet of it. <laughs> I'm like, get out of his fucking way. <laughs> like yeah. let him fucking work and get out of the way. God damn it. That's one of my biggest fucking pet peeves. Jesus. That's but yeah, funny. I, yeah, there's any number of things that happen in seminars that you correct from the dog side and the human side. So yeah he's like yeah three inch and the guy look, oh, are we talking like uh rouse am i showing bro? oh they're like about? how do you know like, <laughs> like now <laughs> it's fucking cold I, well no, duh, like... yeah <laughs> so how do they get a hold of you to to have you come down uh so on my website zyko canine.com if you go on there my phone number's on there email address is on there and then on instagram as well zyko canine training uh you can follow me on there and send me a message on there as well and it's spelled out x-e-i-k-o canine spelled out like the word.com so we'll put it in the show notes also uh logan and those guys will put it in the show notes um so we always have to say because people listen to us on itunes or spotify and it's like then yeah. they're like I, somebody's gonna type z and they're gonna be like what i know i'm gonna get a message be like hey what's his website and i'm like okay. yeah they so, went to a porn site no you, went to uh, yeah. off. <laughs> you tried to do a few a year of the tracking or as many i as- do like yeah, once I retire, obviously I want to do a lot more. But while I'm still working full time, mm-hmm. I'm I'm trying to do four or five a year whenever I can fit them in around you know vacation and days off and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So, and it's always awesome to work with new groups and new people. And hey, it's when I go down there, it's a chance for me to learn too, right? So yeah, it's, uh, it's sharing that's for sure. Well, uh, it was awesome having you on, Ted. What about you? Like, uh, where are you at? Uh, Ted underscore Summers um, on Instagram and then Torchlight Canine Letter K number nine uh for the police dog side, Torchlight Pets if you want to watch us train deaf pit bulls. And um we got a tiny Aussie right now that bites people. It's great. I like it. Uh yeah, she came after me the other day and I she ran me up on top of the bite table. Um Yeah, the fucker's always biting your leg. <laughs> <laughs> um and then uh Oil Capital Canine Fund is the five oh one. It's up and running. Um O C K nine fund. Um dot org is a website and then it's on instagram as well i'm cool. all the same thing on um on facebook um and then i got banned on twitter a couple of times i didn't even do anything like i just it's still like even though likely Elon, story <laughs> no i seriously my profile literally just says i train police dogs and people report my shit because i'm because i train police dogs and i'm part yeah. of the problem so even though papa elon bought it it's still very much a um <laughs> Uh, I have a lot of respect for those dudes like Donut Operator that go on and just fucking troll people. Uh, <laughs> that dude, he has made a career out of trolling people on Twitter. So, uh, or X or whatever the fuck it's called now. So, uh, E, what about you? Or, so, you've got Van I got Van S K9 on Instagram, Van S K9 Academy on Facebook. Um, go to, I don't know if this comes in backwards on the, on the recording. Oh yeah. The tap daddy thing. Tap daddy BJJ is my brand now for uh, us old timer jujitsu guys. That's only on Instagram right now. Tap daddy BJJ. Um, I got stickers in and just handing them out to dudes. Uh, I'll hand them out to young people too, but it's really, really the brand. They get fucking smoked. They get smoked by a fucking geriatric citizen. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like a forty-five-year-old guy with a four hundred one k and three kids just fucked you up, you know that type of. Here's thing. your sticker. So, yeah, here. 
Got tapped. That's a good one. I'm going to bring him in there and just smack dudes with it if I get a if I get a sub on him. But yeah, that's um, mostly Ridgeside Canine Ohio is the pet stuff we on Facebook we put up massive amounts of pictures. You know, just go take a look at pictures and some funny stuff on Instagram uh, on there. Ridgeside Canine Ohio. So. Jason, thanks for having hey, coming on, man. Having you on here was great. I can't remember even who emailed us about you um, and recommended it, but it was good. I'm glad yeah. they did. For sure. Yeah. We haven't had. Uh, thanks for having me on, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, we have. We had Gillespie on from Hits, right? But that was the yeah. last Canadian. We need. We need more. More of you guys up there. So when you yeah. thaw out, folks, give us a call. Are it's you coming down for any of the seminars, uh, Hits, or Hold the Line, or anything this year? Not this year. I'm not. No, yeah. unfortunately, with the seminars I got going on, I'm just trying to balance the yeah. schedule right now. Cool. Well, we'll be there, guys. Uh, Ted and I will be teaching in a booth at Hold the Line, which is coming up uh, pretty soon. And First week of April. Yep. April 8th. Yeah. Yeah, something like Shit. that. And if Joe hears this, he'll fucking slap me. It's the 8th yeah. through the, the 12th. It's, it's like the first, second week of April. Yeah. <laughs> Myrtle Beach. I know that's the correct right. location. Right. So, so then, and then Hits will be in uh, New Orleans this year. So we'll be down there too, teaching. Uh, Ted's doing his um, his uh, scenario based training class. I'll be doing my uh, reducing conflict class, and um, and then it's we'll be hanging at the booth. So bring your gun. Oh. Yep. All right. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. You guys, thanks, have guys. a great night. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Take care. You got your reasons. I got my wants. Still got that feeling, but I'm too old. Working Dog Radio was graciously granted permission to use this music by Brother Deeg. Be sure to check him out at brotherdeeg.blogspot.com. That's spelled brother, D-E-G-E, dot blogspot.com. Be sure to buy him a beer at Amazon, iTunes, or CD Baby, or anywhere you stream your music. Working Dog Radio was edited and co-produced by Alicia Brandt.